from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I do know that for the sympathy of one living being, I would make peace with all. I have love in me the likes of which you can scarcely imagine, and rage the likes of which you would not believe. If I cannot satisfy the one, I will indulge the other. This is Gothic. went out on Lazarus Kane's dinner party, Howard Love had a forkful of roast beef in his mouth. He still has the forkful of roast beef and the fork in his mouth when he registers that he is no longer in the dining hall. There is a slight queasiness in his stomach, like the motion sickness he might get on a cross-channel sea voyage. There is also a very dim illumination. It takes Howard a moment to locate the source of this poor lighting, Tall candles that have melted to short squat candles set into niches in the stonework walls of a room he has never seen before. That room has a low ceiling, barely a foot above the rumpled tufts of Howard's red hair. Where? he whispers, but the rest of the question is silenced when he sees the well in the center of the room. It is wide, six feet across, river stones piled and cemented in a ring, waist high. What? This sentence, Howard lets trail off on its own. He should have known, he thinks to himself. He should have known. Oh, the stories that surrounded Lazarus Kane. Howard had tried to capture some of those stories in caricature in the cartoons that he drew for the local printing, which made it all the more suspicious when he had received an invitation for this dinner party. Why, after all, would the man that Howard Love had infuriated so many times with his parodies parodies that had many a local guffawing and slapping their knees of a fire-warmed winter night by the pub hearth, offer Howard a patronage. For that was what had drawn Howard to Castle Cain through storm and mud. Money was scarce, after all, and a cartoonist's fate was always lurking just around the next corner, waiting for one missed payday. Would he have taken it, knowing that Lord Cain would likely want him to cease and desist? Probably. Doesn't matter now, Howard says aloud. The sound of his own voice frightens him. Echoes come back to him from the low brick walls, from the depths of the well. Now, 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 ow, ow, ow. They say, come to me, say the echoes. No, that isn't right. That, that isn't what he had said. Stories. Stories of frightened servants who spoke of twisted shapes in the darkness, of eyes that stared back at them from places where no eyes could be, of armor that moved without human volition, of shadows that did the same. That is, when there were frightened servants to speak at all. There used to be servants at Castle Cain. When the Lord first came to rule in Bledson, they could be found in the pub or in the shops, and with a drink or two they would tell stories about their Lord. The funny ones... Howard Love drew cartoons about. The others, well, the others were just talk, right? Right? Something gurgles in the depths of the well. Just stories, Howard whispers to himself. Stories. Come hear my story, says the well, softly. So softly that Howard isn't sure he hears anything at all. There is no bucket and rope for this well. It is just a hole in the earth with a rhyme of stone. A black deep, oh, so terribly deep, he can feel its deep, black, deep well that was never made for something so mundane as fetching water. Come hear my story, says the well again. Howard closes his eyes. It is hardly darker behind their walls than the room is in the flicker of candlelight. He takes a step toward the well, toward the hole, toward the voice. No, Howard! Howard stops momentarily. He wonders what he is doing. A glance over his shoulder shows him that there is an exit, the black rectangle of a doorway, shadowed stairs leading upward just beyond. Without quite realizing how, he finds himself at the edge of the well and scenes from the ring play out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was about to say. No. Howard leans forward. He looks down into the maw of the well. He sees the things that stir there, that writhe and coil there. And with that seeing, he screams. And with that scream, 
The camera pans back, out through the door, up the stairs, up into a different kind of darkness. The house shivers, the floorboards creak, the suits of armor dance for a moment in their alcoves, and the chandeliers sway, for the castle of Cain has been fed its first meal of this long, bloody night. Previously on Gothic, finding themselves transported by unknown means to various and diverse parts of the Castle Cain, our three travelers discovered that they weren't the only ones thusly displaced. Grace Moreau, opera singer and member of a mysterious and secretive monster-hunting sect, found herself in a bedroom with the rakish Nathan Redbone. The immortal Chauncey Candlewick materialized on a balcony opening into a bathing room wherein was also one of Grace's opera company's ingenues, and the otherworldly Lori found themselves in a hallway with the young and very frightened Esbella. Mr. Candlewick was soon alone again, however, as his hesitation resulted in Priscilla Durain being pulled below the waters of the clawfoot tub by hands that could not be. Determined to find the others and wreak havoc for the crimes committed in the castle this night, he set off to explore the castle. Grace and Nathan Redbone also decided to investigate, but were soon joined by Lori, who, using strange magics, attempted to transport themselves and Esbella to Grace's side after encountering a mechanical and distinctly not supernatural trap. But only the otherworlder appeared. Esbella went somewhere else. That somewhere was to a hallway near Mr. Candlewick. Together, they faced a new threat, a skeleton emerging from the darkness, brandishing a weapon with the apparent intent to kill them both. Uh, I'm going to leave Chauncey with the skeleton for just a moment. Let's go to uh, Grace and Lori and uh, Redbone. Um, you have uh, also made your way out into the hallway, yes, and are um, yeah. looking for others. It, is it a similar hallway? Um, all the hallways seem very similar to one another here. Is there a pile of armor on the ground? No, the hallway that you enter here does not have a pile of armor on the ground. But um, you do definitely start getting the idea that all of the hallways have alcoves with armor in them, that uh, there are gas lamp sconces in the walls, even though they are not all lit, and that they are really kind of maze-like in this vast, sprawling castle. So, in fact, I need you Hmm. to... Um, act under pressure. You're really just trying to find anybody else, right? Uh, yeah, I think specifically we're going to try and find Esbella, but since neither of us knows how to get to her... I do. I can I can get right to her if we need to. Angel, wing it up. Grab Grace's hand, grab Redbone's hand, and let's roll some dice. Whee! <laughs> okay. This is great. <laughs> let's see what happens. Yay! Eleven. Oh, sorry, twelve. Nice. Ooh, that is nice. So that means you all go where you want to go, right? Yep, right to Esbella. The hands claw at her, rip her dress, the one she'd so carefully chosen when she had seen the name of Grace Moreau on the invitation. They wrap their fingers around her ankles, her calves, her thigh. They are everywhere, groping her, pulling at her, wrenching her down. The figure in the balcony doorway... The one who had flung open the doors, shattering the glass and shredding the rich velvet curtains as surely as the cold, greasy hands were shredding her evening gown and her flesh. That figure had frightened her, but now she held out her arms toward it, toward the only hope and help she could find in the room she had suddenly appeared in. The man takes a step toward her, with his black top hat and his impeccable suit, save for his muddy feet, his muddy feet. He should have been an angel. But a cast to one eye, a sneer of lip, made of him a devil. Priscilla de Argen starts to speak, but the voice is ripped out of her when the clawing hands, all of them at once, grip her calves and thighs tight and wrench her down into the cold water of the big porcelain tub she had so inexplicably found herself in. Not inexplicable, a portion of her brain noted. She had heard whispers in the galleries of the opera houses she and Grace performed in. She had seen things that should have been unseeable, things that Grace had barely blinked at. Oh, how she had wanted that knowledge. She had wanted in. And now she was. Oh, she would have laughed at the irony. She had wanted in, and so she had written to Lord Lazarus Kane, told him she knew of a way to get Grace to finally gift him with an appearance at his castle, 
had told him that Grace would never be able to resist the allure of an assemblage of glitterati. She had hoped that, by putting the two together, she would finally see the truth behind the curtain, because, oh, the rumors that swirled around Lord Bledson. Priscilla had only ever wanted Grace to let her in, and now she was in. Tugged below water that couldn't be this deep, couldn't, by hands that couldn't exist, couldn't. Her own fingers find purchase on the lip of the clawfoot tub, but the porcelain is slick with water and blood, her blood. Her last hope, as their hands twine themselves in her hair and force her nose and eyes and mouth beneath the water, is that the man in black will reach down, grip her wrist, and pull her to safety. Instead, she is dragged into the deep. Let's go back to uh, Chauncey, a uh, skeleton coming right toward you. First off, uh, seeing the creature for what it is now, in my in my history, would I know that, that if this skeleton is a, a mindless, shambling thing, or does it have any, any bit of reasoning with it that I could communicate to it? Mm, I don't know. What's your previous experience with skeletons, Chauncey? I would say that there are some that are reanimated to a higher level of intellect to serve uh, various roles. And there are some that are just mindless butchers who wander random dark hallways looking for young women. Why not young men? The ones that you have encountered in the past that have been um, intelligent, that have had their own motivations and goals and hopes and dreams and such, tend to have glowing red eyes. Dope. This one does not. Mm, okay. All you see behind these eyes is just the blackness of the skull that's beyond the hole. Well, in that case, if this is just some mangy dog of its master, I'm going to, uh... Damn it, there's a woman in front of me, isn't there? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna think back to the poor woman in the bathtub. Yeah, the fa- I'm gonna think of Priscilla. And I don't... Even though I don't trust this little girl who meandered around the curiosity shop, I am still trying to do the best a bad guy can. I'm gonna try to protect her from this thing. So that would be, uh, protect someone? Instead of just going full tilt on it. I'm going to put her welfare above my own. Uh, I know. Yes. I know, right? They can see me now. Oh, snake eyes. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at this. Well, another experience point for you, though. Chauncey learns a lot. You, you hesitate again. Oh. And in that hesitation, uh, you... You see what's going to happen. I mean, even before it happens, you Uh, see the skeleton raise its machete. You see the machete um, coming down and just splitting, um, just splitting Isabella's skull in half. Brain matter flowing out. You, you, you even almost smell the the gore of it all, and you know that your hesitation has cost another life. Oh, god damn it! Except that at that moment, at that moment, Lori and Grace and um, Redbone all materialize in a the, what sounds like the flapping of wings. And although Grace and Lori appear to either side of uh, Esbella, Redbone kind of wrenches his arms free at the last moment and just crashes into the skeleton. And they both go down in a heap of bones and blades and and Redbone's uh, increasingly um, uh, nasty-looking clothes, (laughs) because those are not weathering the evening very well. As Redbone stands up, he's he's tangled up in something, and he goes, what the... And he's, like, kind of pulling them away from himself, and he says, wires. These are all wires. And, yes, indeed, it appears that the skeleton was attached to a runner up above, which you can uh. see now with more light, that uh, it just sort of slid down toward you on this runner on wires. Uh, I guess, the, you know, fate can be a little kind to you every now and then. <laughs> so that seems to put all of you together in the hallway with Nathan Redbone and Isabella. All right. We're a party of five. Hey, they're remaking that show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Well, I'm going to curse myself because uh, I uh, hesitated again horribly, um, but at least this time nobody got drugged to some supernatural hell. Uh, um, uh, I think I'm going to have a look around and try to figure out what triggered all of this and see if I can try to figure out maybe if is somebody watching us pulling the strings as we're going or are we just stepping on random traps? Okay. 
So you're wanting to investigate uh, a mystery, it appears. Yes, yes. Yes, I would like to. And that is... <laughs> God damn. <laughs> That's not sounding good. <laughs> it's... Come on, James. <laughs> All right, um, that's a that's a that's a total of five, grand total of five. Where did you get those dice? I switched them out. They're different. <laughs> so Chauncey Candlewick, um, you start poking around, um, just like you know, ignoring um, Nathan Redbone's uh, vomit uh, because he threw up again. How much did this man have in his stomach? <laughs> He ate a lot before you guys got there, too. A lot of appetite. Well, and he was drinking when we first arrived, also. Uh, yes, this is true. I think. I think. Yeah, uh, he uh, he did say that he had been drinking for a solid two hours. So uh, you are poking around the skeleton, um, the wires. You're kind of looking up to see where the, the zip line is. And it leads back, um, actually, to a set of stairs... Uh, a stairwell that goes both up and down, but uh, right before that point, it looks like there's a, a secret uh, door or something in the um, in the roof of the in the ceiling of the um, of the hallway. Oh, uh, where it's open now, and that looks like where the skeleton um, emerged from and then slid down the uh, the rope. However, as you're peering up there and about to maybe turn and say something along the lines of Hey guys, there's a secret door right here. Uh, <laughs> three figures leap out of that secret door and plunge toward oh, you. Yeah. Now, am I correct in assuming that the only light source is the candle that I'm still holding? Good grief. Um, so, yes, you are <laughs> correct. I thought there were torches in the hallway. I thought there were, like, no, uh, sconces. You guys were in a hallway that had gas lamps, but then you teleported to where Chauncey yes. and Isabella were, ah, and they were in a hallway that was dark that just had um, it just had the candle. Okay. The candle for candle. Wick. Oh, man, I know. <laughs> All right, then. Figures leaving out. Um, I'm, I'm a little furious. I think uh, it's, it's time to uh, kick their ass. Um, and that's... Let's see if you can break your streak. God damn it. <laughs> what did you roll? Uh, I have a grand total of six. <laughs> okay. So mark experience, but you also get to uh, have an advancement there. Yeah? Yes. Yes. He's going to be like level 16. Three figures pile on you and take you down to the ground. And so back uh, at uh, Grace and Lori mm -hmm. and Isabella, uh, you see as... Chauncey starts forward, he's investigating everything, and then he holds one hand, he has his um, candle, and the other hand, he holds his hat on his head as he looks up into what appears to be a dark space in the ceiling, but it's hardly any time at all before um, three figures fall out of that space and onto him, but as he, he tries to do something, he throws up his hands, but this does two things at once. One, it flings the candle off to one side where it immediately goes out, uh, pitching the entire hallway into darkness. Uh, and also his hat is flung off to the side. Oh, no! And, uh, and you hear him you hear him yell, and it may be about the hat, I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but also the last thing you see before the light goes out is him being buried under this pile of uh, figures. Well, I would like to cast some light on the situation and uh, use magic to create a bright light in the passageway. Hold on a second, though, because this is something we haven't talked about. Um, how prevalent would you say magic is in this world? Um, can anybody do it, or is it just the... <laughs> pardon my usage of the word, initiated that can do it. I have a feeling that ancient beings such as Lori and Chauncey might be able to do so no matter what, but, but where does your magic come from? I would imagine it's a lot of training and like magical items rather than being something that's kind of innate. So it's not just like anybody on the street corner can just go around casting spells. That's not what I was picturing. All right. Well, that sounds good. Uh, okay. So, Grace, you want to pull up light. You want to create light yeah. here using a spell. Tell me the first time you ever did this spell. 
Uh, so I was picturing this spell being an item that I somehow activate, and uh, probably I had a, a class or a, a study session of some kind in which I was taught um, not just how to activate the item, but how to how to uh, create one if I ever needed to. So I kind of picture like my mentor standing standing there, going like, "Again, again, do it again. You have to do it right every time. It has to go off perfectly every time." So you have to create some sort of some sort of thing. You have to cast this on something in order for it to work. Uh, I was kind of picturing more of like something that I had had uh, spent time on beforehand, and it just requires some kind of activation procedure. I was picturing a piece of jewelry, like a pendant, that I would pull from my neck and smash on the ground or something. Will that limit the light? Will it travel with you, or will it just be in this space then? I actually kind of like the idea of it just being in this space. To make this happen, though, you've got to make a roll. It's called Use Magic. Do it. Uh, so I also have a move called That Old Black Magic. When I use magic, I can ask a question from the Investigate a Mystery move as an effect. So I... I don't like your characters. <laughs> 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 oh, wait, no. In Monster of the Week, the Keeper is supposed to be a fan of the characters, yeah. No, I love your characters. Uh, great. <laughs> well, fittingly, there's a question from Investigative Mystery that's what is being concealed here. And I thought that would be a question that could be revealed by light appearing in the tunnel. It's a nine. It's going to work. There's just one problem. When your pendant breaks on the ground and light floods the area, you find yourself in a... No! Um, in a conservatory of some sort. I stamp uh, my foot on there... the ground. There is a uh, high ceiling. It's all glassed in, and uh, there are numerous potted plants around with chairs in convenient areas for sitting. It's all a nicely well-lit area now <laughs> because your magical light is um, shining around here quite nicely. And is Chauncey still there, though? Uh, Chauncey is not, oh. <laughs> and you are not. <laughs> I am not. Uh, you are not either, no. Lori, you are in the dark still, but it feels like a different space. It feels more open. Not like you're outside. It just feels like a larger room. Mr. Candlewick, you feel claws raking at you. And although any one of these, uh, your basic uh, immortality, your ability to heal super fast would immediately uh, heal these wounds up, there's just so many of oh. them. You take a total of three harm. Yeah. And of course, well, any armor and your immortality will reduce that. But uh, you do take three harm. Okay. It is non-armor defeating. I just get a choice of a weapon, no armor. Ow, 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 ow. I will destroy them. Ooh, does that mean you're going to try to kick some ass again? <laughs> I will. <laughs> I certainly will. And uh, feeling my new unholy strength rising up in me, hopefully it will do something. Oh, wait a sec. Where's my hat? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Attack. <laughs> That's better. That's a 10. On a 10 plus, you get to choose an extra effect. You know what I want to do? I want to force all these 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 guys off that bottom choice. You force them where you want them. I don't want them on top of me anymore. I want them gone. Uh, when you're doing this kick some ass, are you using your magical force attack? or? I am. And it ignores armor. Uh, it's only one, I think. You fling your arms out uh, in the motions of uh, both um, karate and... <laughs> Uh, magical summoning <laughs> and your magical blades of force appear and uh, just sort of sweep aside your attackers and in that brief moment of light there because your energy blades do come with some lighting of their own you just see these hideously deformed faces all sunken in on the skulls but they're humanoid they're they're obviously once were people but now they are just mummified carcasses mm. of what they once were. And sharpened teeth and claws that are just... The claws are actually there because the skin has just receded from the bone so much that it's just sharpened ends of bones on their... On ghastly. Their of their fingers. Lori, get your butt over here. It is pretty ghastly, especially since you just have 
the moment of light as you are attacking them to see them as they are flung off of you and hit various walls or stairs or other surfaces. And then it's dark again, and you yell out, Lori, get your ass over here. But you're met with only silence. And a voice that says, I don't think they're here anymore. Oh, God. Oh, did by chance that I see my hat? <laughs> Roll act under <laughs> pressure. <laughs> that is a total of seven. Seven is not a failure. Yay! However, I do get to give you some choices. <laughs> and this is this is quite fun for me, so thank you for loving this hat so much. I need my hat. <laughs> you see your hat, but a uh, one of these ghoul things just landed on it and crushed it. Or you see the hat, but it's behind all of the ghouls, uh, or at least two of them, where it landed after you flung them. Or you see your hat, but one of the ghouls has picked it up and it's on his head. Oh my god. Uh, (laughs) I love this. Oh, that's horrible. (laughs) We're going to go with the ghoul has it on his head. (laughs) Okay, thank you very much. That's an excellent choice. (laughs) So if any of you out there are listening and you're doing fan uh, art of this, I I need to see this. So please uh, do this art and uh, send it to (laughs) uh, thegothicpodcast at gmail.com or uh, um, tag us on Twitter. And uh, I want to see this. I want to see this ghoul with this hat. (laughs) Okay. You fling the ghouls off of you, um, Chauncey, and in that brief moment of light, you see that one of them is wearing your hat, and you yell out for Lori to get over here, and and then Isabella answers, I don't think they're here anymore, and then we're going to cut away to Lori. Lori, you're in a, a large empty space, and you don't feel the others nearby. All right, no others? Yeah. Okay, um, also, uh, I, I imagined my glowing eyes would provide me with some kind of dark vision as well. Oh, do you now? <laughs> All right, that makes a certain amount of sense. What do you imagine this looking like? A lot like your dark vision would provide in, like, D&D, where it's like, you, you still can see things but it's just like a shades of gray and so your divine nature gives you the ability to see through both metaphorical and real darkness yes um you start focusing uh, because you had to take a moment to adjust from the uh, candlelight that you did have a moment ago but you you look around and you see a long dining room table and a throne-like chair at the uh, at one end, and a chandelier that uh, is made up of numerous bones of various animals. So different from the initial dining room we were in. Nope, it's it's the same one. Oh, okay. It's the same dining hall. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could have said, "Hey, you're in the same dining room as where you started all of this out." How in the hell did I end up back here? You also see the servants who were here, but you see them now as almost translucent shapes, and they are all around you and coming closer, and as they do, you realize that they're not actually touching the floor. Uh, They're floating toward you, and as they do so, their, their whole shape changes their whole look changes faces elongate and teeth lengthen lengthen arms elongate and hands become huge and clawed as these ghostly now ghostly figures converge upon you unholy beings just what i had let's see what's happening with grace oh (laughs) grace you're in the conservatory with the crowbar (laughs) (laughs) you know the image of this conservatory I get from playing countless games of Clue. <laughs> you hear from behind you a low growl. Uh, well, now I'm mad because I was well ahead of my backup to fight these dudes who had just dogpiled on Chauncey. And then I got transported just as I did this cool magic. Well, first of all, the uh, uh, question, what is being concealed here? Did we ever get an answer to that? Uh, you turn and you see pushing aside the frond of a large fern and kind of coming out of what darkness there is there is a mastiff-sized hound 
It's uh, uh, It has no fur to speak yeah. of, or if it does, it's very close. Its skin is uh, red to almost to the point of being black, just reddened and, and blackened in places. And its eyes glow with a ruddy red light. And you also see as it opens its mouth, uh, its black maw, that deep down in its gullet, flames kindle. Great. Okay. Nice puppy. Okay, Laurie. Let's go with Laurie. Do it. Unholy creatures. Be gone as I uncoil my razor whip from beneath my robe. You have a razor whip. I have a razor whip. Ooh, fancy. Three harm, hand, area, messy, holy. <laughs> That's pretty serious. Dang. It's a holy razor whip. How do? You, what does this thing look like? Is it made of razors? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I imagine to have like a serious handle on it and then down the whip it's got little razors embedded in it. Really? I believe in you. Don't gain experience. Oh my god, that's a 12 plus my tough. Yeah, 14. Well, that is a stellar success. You get an extra effect. And this was an area weapon as well. Area weapons, by the way, can deal with uh, more than one attacker. And these are all kind of within range, so... Let's go with inflict terrible harm. So add one. So four harm total. Jesus. Wow. Crikey, man. Lori lashes out with the razor whip. It spins in a vast circle around him, uh, slicing through all of the spectral servants as they approach with their maws wide. Their rage and their hunger turns to screams as the holy weapon slices through their incorporeal bodies, uh, making wisps of all of them. Yeah. Razor whip! Now we got to do that every time. It's just gonna be like it's gonna be like the Wonder Woman theme song from the uh, from the seventies. Uh, Razor, Razor whip. whip. Um, anything left? Uh... No, they just they you sliced right through them and and they vanished in in into incorporeal fog. Sounds great. Actually, if you want to investigate a mystery here, I can give you more information about them if you get the right. I would love to actually. Let's see on my sharp seven. Oh, uh, what was it going to do? These, you know, uh, were were ghosts. They were, act, I mean, they were not trickery. They were not fakery. Those were ghostly spirits. You could sense yes. their um, otherworldliness. Don't hire ghosts. <laughs> they wanted to, well, were you mortal like many people in the building? Um, they would have... Uh, rip your soul from your body. Uh, but they could have done terrible physical uh, harm to you as well, especially in those numbers. At this point, I want to reconnect, and I'm just trying to figure out whether I want to... Uh, actually, I would probably choose to go for Grace, since Mr. Monstrous is not on my most favored list, and I want to protect a more innocent being. <laughs> yeah. Um... Uh, protect a more innocent i will i would probably want to angel wing to grace i'm not trying to take anyone with me so i can go chauncey i've got three ugly ghouls in in this hall with me i've got at least two non-magical monstrous hunting peoples behind me i i'm going to yell at was it mr redbone and miss yadada and tell them to stick together and flee run for their lives i will hold them here and then I'm going to press the attack. <laughs> Isabella says, no, I mean, I really think that everybody else is gone. Run, you fools! They're going to eat your flesh and sup on your soul! <laughs> God damn, I'm going to have her head on a spike. They're going to step on my soul? Okay, I'm running, I'm running! And you, you hear Isabella running away. <laughs> I said stick together! And then you hear her hit a wall, because... <laughs> Whatever, I did, my, I did as much as I will. Okay, there was a ghoul with a hat in a direction somewhere down that hall... I just want to unleash hell in that direction. <laughs> that is 10 again. I'm going to take the uh, uh, the plus one forward. So with your uh, attacks, you have, I mean, they have enough brains among them to now be wary of you. So that's going to give you a bit of an advantage uh, as you as you go forward. Uh, what did you say your damage was? One? Uh, it's one ignores armor. Please tell me Redbone at least ran. What Isabella uh, what Isabella was saying is that she's the only one back there. Oh, well, I can't worry and do anything about it now. Uh, however, um, 
in the light of your magical attack, uh, you see that the ghoul with the hat, your blade slashes right through his face, and it just sluices off, and your hat goes tumbling to the ground. Ah, uh, better. All right. So, you know, I've got this, this picture of this little fight in this hallway playing out in my mind as I'm hurling these blades down there. And there's like brief moments of illumination. And so all these ghouls are moving in this stop motion kind of a, kind of picture in my mind. And I just see this hat transfer off of one to the other, like in the, in the, in the middle of like some kind of rave. So it's, it's, I just wanted to throw that out there real quick. But It's a ghoul rave. Yes, and they're all going to die here. <laughs> Only two left. Okay. Is she still bumping into walls somewhere behind me? Do you want to take the time to listen for that? No time. Attack. Back in the direction of new Mr. Thief of my hat. I'm going to start hurling stuff again into the dark. Now, do you have any concerns? Well, you should have concerns, I suppose, about actually slicing your hat. Because that is, if you roll badly, that is going to be one of the options. (laughs) You know what? If I roll badly... Um, it might be worth being lucky for, just so I don't <laughs> destroy my poor little hat. And the first use of a luck point for your hat. <laughs> it's my hat. <laughs> it's important. So with my forward, that is a total of 11. Well, I am going to uh, inflict terrible harm on this poor fool. Who has taken your hat. Yep, and so it ignores armor, and he takes two. That uh, slices another one of the ghouls in twain. Ghoul innards, uh, for a moment, flash in the strobe light of your magic blades as they spew everywhere from the guts of this mummified uh, being. And the hat uh, goes flying and uh, is not caught by the third ghoul, but it rather lands at his feet. And it, just in the afterglow of the uh, light, you uh, you see a look that sort of seems a little bit like horror pass over the ghoul's <laughs> face, and it kicks the hat away as far as it will go, and then it and then it is dark again. Excellent. All right, Chauncey, finish off this last ghoul or don't one one way or the other. Okay, uh, these things seem to have a, a little bit of intelligence to them, uh, not just completely mindless. Um, yes. So I am going to use one of my other abilities, uh, which is called Dark Negotiator, and I'm going to growl at this thing, and I'm going to tell it to flee for its life and tell its master that I'm coming for it, and what I'm going to offer it, it, it I'm going to offer its life. I, mean, I just want this thing out of my sight, or I'm going to remove its face like it's two compadres. You tell him hell's coming, and I'm coming with it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, wait, no, the other way around. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, I'll I'll try. I'm not good at charm. All right, so, you know, it's just for flair. If he doesn't want to run, I'm going to take his face anyway. He touched the hat. He's going to die sooner or later. Oh, It's the way of the hat. This is the way. This is the way of the hat. (laughs) So I got a nine total. I have spoken. Oh, God. I got a nine total, and so if I use my plus one, uh, it'll make it a ten. So... They'll do it for the reason you gave them? Seems reasonable to me, says the ghoul. (laughs) Yes, okay. (laughs) Flea, tell your master I'm coming for him, and if I ever see you again, I'm going to cut your face off. Nice. Yes, yeah. Wait, no. Sorry, hold on. I shall, says something in the darkness, because it is still dark. Oh, yes. And then you hear it. You hear it slurping away. And from behind you, you hear, Oh, my head. Oh. Uh, first things first. Recover the hat. The hat. As his belly gets gets up, and you recover the hat and put it on your head. Yeah, and then I'm gonna go help her out. Find my candle. It is still dark. You do find the candle. Um, you can even get it relit. I assume you have. Uh, I mean, even the slightest bit of magic. I won't even make you roll oh. or use magic. You just flick the spell or uh, flick the uh, candle into uh, into uh, life, and um, and uh, you see the remnants of the other ghouls all splattered around, mm. and you do see Isabella at the end of the hall. Um, it looks like she wasn't. I mean, she didn't just run right into a wall. She she ran into a. Um, uh, the arm of a suit of armor that is uh, sticking out from the wall, from the alcove that it's in. So I'm going to turn to her, and I'm going to demand, what have you done with Nathan Redbone? What? I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> Look, people keep appearing and vanishing, and there's, like, sounds, and there's people with glowing eyes. And it's nonsense. I saw you in the curio shop. What are you... And what? your hat's really scary, <laughs> and... <laughs> you should be scared of me. 
And I'm going to get up to her. What were, what were you doing in that curio shop? Why are you here? And why do people keep disappearing around you? Manipulate someone. Oh, not that good. <laughs> so that one was a four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so uh, very scared. I mean, obviously just super frightened of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Isabella sa- looks up at you and says, I, the curio shop, I, I was looking for a watch for my grandfather, but... Uh, he, he likes very specific things. And so, uh, I mean, I was just asking questions based on that. I, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. You completely believe her. God damn it. I'm going to pick my hat up off my head, take a look at it, dust it off, put it back, and look around. Where did everyone else get off to? Good place to find out where everyone else is getting off to. So, <laughs> wait, that sounded bad. Uh, that's a good place to find out what everybody else is doing. Grace, let's deal with the um, with the hellhound. Well, I mean, besides immediately regretting my choice of weapons, I think I want to, uh, yeah, so I, I want to kind of, you know, back away in circle as it's approaching me. And in the meantime, I'm like out of my peripheral vision, scanning my environment for things that might be useful. Okay, so read a bad situation. Nine. Nine is a hold one. Well, I feel like I'm not in a good situation to fight this dog-shaped thing right now. So I'm going to ask, what's my best way out? You actually see off to your left, not in the direction that the hellhound is slowly padding its way toward you. um, But you see a set of double doors. They're glass, so not a lot of uh, cover there, but they do appear to at least go out of the conservatory. And uh, to answer your earlier question, just from looking through the sky, uh, through the skylight, and uh, just from what you know generally of um, architecture, you would put the uh, conservatory on the first floor. So I can't chuck it out a window and have it fall down five stories. Sorry. Well, there is a moat surrounding the castle, so... This is true, and it is a fire type. I mean, and I would love to see this happen. Remember, I'm rooting for you, but I'm here in case you fail as well. I mean, (laughs) so the thing is, realistically, I'm not going to outrun it, because it's basically an evil dog. Can the evil dog open doors? There are glass doors. Oh, it's a large oh God. dog. It's, no, never, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it can, yeah, it can, it can open, open the door, door very effectively. Uh, if my memory serves, I think I still have one of my fighting sticks in my hand. And uh, I have two. I think I'm going to draw the other one and uh, try and hit it very hard in the face. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lordy Lord. Okay, well, that's a five. So that went about as well as I expected. Mark experience. <laughs> so you draw your uh, weapons, um, your fighting sticks, and brace yourself for the uh, hellhound's attack. Um, an attack that doesn't, in fact, come uh, because as it pads forward, it sort of leans back on its haunches and opens its mouth. Oh, good. And then this roar of fire just rolls out of it. Hey there, Sojourners. C. Patrick here with some announcements. For one, I know you'll probably curse us on Twitter for the cliffhanger ending of this episode, but to make up for it, we have some flashback episodes recorded. We'll be bringing you the first of those, Grace and the Plague Doctors of Paris, next Thursday as a bonus episode available to everyone. Also, we now have a Twitch channel located at twitch.tv slash thegothicpodcast. We won't be streaming these episodes there, Uh, Sorry, we can barely manage to get it together enough to record the audio. But follow us on Twitch and get notified when we stream some other fun things now and again. For instance, right now and for about 14 days, assuming all went well, you should be able to watch me run the first game of a 5th edition D&D home campaign my roomies and I just started playing. The Gothic Podcast is co-hosting that with Churro Yeti, so if you like live video game play, you should also check out her Twitch stream at twitch.tv slash churro yeti spelled uh, as if a Yeti was made out of churros. I think that's about it for this week. We'll see you again next week for the flashback episode, and then the following Thursday for episode four of Hounds and Horror. Now, I'll let you get back to your normally scheduled credits.
The Gothic Podcast is produced by C. Patrick Nagel, with theme music by Zoe Hovland and cover artwork by Jared George Art. Listen to The Gothic Podcast on Podbean or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow The Gothic Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, or email us at thegothicpodcast at gmail.com. Support for The Gothic Podcast comes from you, our listeners, so please visit our Patreon page. Thanks.